Today, we are tearing something apart, and that is specifically this, the Emission RCRF power meter. Over the last couple of weeks and months, there's been a lot of talk about using this to measure signals from digital VTXs such as HD0. And while some people have been getting results that make sense, others, like myself, haven't. And I've seen a wide, varied set of results with this meter, but not only that, some strange behavior as well. I've been doing a lot of testing on the bench with this, trying to understand testing methods, and whilst I've improved things, in the end, I've come to the conclusion I need to understand how this thing has been designed, what they're actually doing to measure the RF, so I can understand if it's actually something worth pursuing with further or not from how accurate it is. So today, what we're going to do is walk you guys through the PCB. I've already torn it apart. It's there in front of me in bits, as you can see. I'm going to show you the circuit layout as well as the RF front end, explain what is being done in this, and then at the end, I'm going to give you my thoughts on if you should really consider this a tool or not. Just before we jump into that though, I just want to say if you find this video interesting, please do consider hitting the subscribe button and don't forget to hit the little bell next to it as well. If you'd like to support us to continue to make destructive content like this, because I'm not sure it will ever work properly again, please do consider checking out my Patreon as well as buy me a coffee too. Anyway, let's get under the overhead camera first of all, and then we'll get under the microscope and walk you through what's going on. Okay, so I'm not going to show you the actual teardown of this, but I am just going to show you the bits involved. As you can see, I've disassembled it. We've got the back cover, we've got the front cover, we've got the battery holder, which is also the main holder for the PCB, and we've got the PCB itself. What you have is this back side of the board with the USB connector, as well as a multi-controller and a little logo here, which we'll talk about in a minute. And on this side, we've got the OLED display, as well as the RF circuitry here and the control buttons. What we'll do next is get under the microscope and actually get in closer and show you what is actually going on. Okay, so we have the power meter under the microscope and we're going to look at the back side of the board first before we go and take a look at the really interesting bit on the front side with the RF. So. On here, we have our micro USB port and we have our two battery input terminals where I've desoldered the wires. On this side of the board, we have all of the main circuitry for the processor as well as the power input. So down here, we have voltage regulation. I haven't looked into this too much. This may actually be a boost converter, but the chances are it's voltage regulation. And then we have our main SOC up here, which is an STM32L series. Now the L series, is the low power variant of the STM32s. It's based on the Cortex M0 MCU. It's got 64 kilobytes of flash and it's a 32 megahertz CPU with USB input. And that is what all of the software on the device is running on to give you the menu control and the settings and everything else like that. Moving down here, you can see the revision of the board is version 1.0 and you can see it was October 17th was when it was designed, is what I'm guessing. Don't think this one would have been manufactured in October 17, but certainly maybe designed then. You've then got all of the additional circuitry around the MCU. We have what looks to be some test programming or UART ports. Then moving down to the rest of the board, on this side you can see we've got a logo on the back side, on the opposite side of the RF side of things, which we'll flip over to in a minute. Flipping it over to the other side, we've then got our joystick button as well as our power button we've got our OLED screen which yes looks a little bit worse for wear because unfortunately getting into this did take a bit of um, persuasion in the sense of there was a shielding can located over the RF circuit which I'll show you in a minute and I had to use a lot of heat to get it off which is this little thing here and unfortunately the screen took a little bit of that as well even though I did move it however it does actually still work and it's still readable but I will probably replace this because it is a straightforward OLED display I found a few places on eBay that seems to sell them as part of kits for using with Arduinos and stuff like that so I shouldn't have any problems there's nothing actually located under the LCD or OLED other than the uh, connector itself but uh, yeah it does still work but it's not looking good. Now this is the next real interesting bit and this is 
the RF front end of the power meter. Now, as I said, this was all hidden under a shielding can. If I place that there, you can see it was like that. So we had to use a lot of hot air in the end to actually get that off. Did do it without causing any damage other than what you can see on the OLED display. Okay, so now we're in closer, we can see what is actually going on. I'm gonna walk through what the layout of the circuit is as well as what each device is. Now we've got our main antenna input on the power meter here, which comes in and it goes straight into this little chip you can see here. It's then passed along here. It has a resistor going to ground and it, then it has a capacitor going into this main IC. And then that is outputting and that is heading off back to the multi-controller. We then have this little IC up here, which is handling voltage regulation. And this is what's basically providing the power for the other parts of the circuit here, as I understand it. Now, the first thing to understand is what this chip here is. If we tilt it up, you should be able to see that it is labelled YT35H2. Now, after some investigation, it turns out that this is a 30 dB attenuator for mini circuits. If I just jump over to the desktop, hop onto that and hop in here, you can guys can see that we have this fixed 30 dB attenuator for mini circuits, which identifies as a YT30. It actually explains a lot that there is a 30 dB attenuator on this because the main RF detector, which we'll take a look at in a minute, can't handle the input that this device is capable of. So what it appears they're doing is basically attenuating that input signal before it reaches the RF detector IC. This chip is nothing particularly special. It is a single chip RF attenuator, which is capable of up to two watts max. And it's available in different attenuations. And the one we've got here being labeled YT30 means it's the 30 dB equivalent. Having this here, actually explains quite a lot about some of the issues we've seen with the RF power meter when using external attenuation below 500 milliwatts. Because in my tests, I found that you need the attenuator above 500, but you don't below. And when you do use it below, you get some strange readings. And the reason for that will be you are already attenuating the signal by 30 dB already and adding more attenuation is simply making it so weak the RF detector isn't going to be able to do a good job of being being able to detect it. Looking down, again, as I've said, there's nothing particularly special, but it does tell us in this what the pinout of it is, all of the basic information on it, as well as the packaged identification, which is loaded on it here somewhere. If I just scroll down, there is a, a little bit which shows it's labeled as YT30. Here we go, down at the bottom by the product markings, you can see that it is clearly labeled a YT30 device. And again, you've got the pinout with the RF heads in, moves through and heads out. So that's the first part of the circuit. From the attenuator, you can then see the signal moves along and it comes into this IC here, which is labeled Q2FG. Now, it has taken me quite a few days to figure out what this is, but I have finally found it in a data sheet. It is the RF detector chip that is converting the RF signal you're seeing here into a voltage output to be read via the multi-controller. As I've mentioned earlier, we have this little IC up here, and my belief with this is that it is either a buck converter or a boost converter to provide stable voltage to this chip, allowing it to get the best possible performance, i.e. the highest amount of accuracy. Now, again, if we hop over to the data sheet for this chip, so the chip which has the markings Q2FG is actually the analog devices AD8319, as I understand it, or at least this is all I have been able to find that corresponds with those case markings and is an RF detector. This chip is a dual purpose chip. It is capable of being an RF detector for measuring RF levels, but it can also be an RF feedback circuit, allowing it to be used as a controller with an amplifier, for instance, when you're trying to make sure that the output you've got is correct. But it does have two modes of operation, so they're just using it in that RF detection mode, which takes that RF energy and converts it into voltage for the multi-controller to receive.
Now, there is some interesting data in the data sheet for this, specifically some of the specifications. It's designed to work between 1 megahertz and 10 gigs, which is good. It has a 45 dB dynamic range. It has an accuracy of plus minus 1 dB over temperature, and it has a temperature stability of 0.5 dB. Now, these specifications actually explain a lot about what's been going on with people getting varying readings on these meters. Basically, it has plus minus 1 dB accuracy plus another 0.5 dB due to temperature. While at low dB levels, that might not be a massive amount, at high dB levels, it's going to change everything. So, for instance, 1 dB at 30 dB or 1 watt is over 200 milliwatts of difference. If we're talking one and a half dB, it just shows that whilst the device is capable of measuring RF energy, it isn't dramatically accurate when there is that ability for it to actually shift up and down plus minus up to that one and a half dB. As you can see in the data sheet, there's a huge amount of info, including the specifics on the chip and the branding or case markings as it's known, which is labeled as Q2, as you've seen under the microscope. I am 99% this is the right chip because it adds up on a pinout point of view. That all aligns correctly. The branding aligns correctly and it's an RF detector as well. With a lot of the small chips like this, like DFN or QFNs that are this small, they don't put the full part numbers on. They use a branding mark and that's what I've been able to identify it by. So, as you can see, that's pretty much it from the circuit. It really is as simple as that RF energy coming in, 30 dB attenuator into the RF detector. That then is passed on and handed over to the microcontroller, which will be using its ADC to convert that into a number, and then that's being displayed on the screen with conversion to give you that RF dB or milliwatt output. Since making the hardware part of this video, I've been doing a bit more digging on the software and I've been sharing a few bits around the place. Now, a few people have reached out, including the great Joshua Bardwell, and he shared some info that he had from Tony at Immersion RC with regards to the meter. As I've shown, the hardware on this is very, very basic. There is nothing particularly special going on here. We have an RF input into a 30 dB attenuator into a basic RF sensor that is converting the RF into a voltage that is being read by the STM32 via the ADC and then being displayed on the screen. The real magic to this device is in the software that Immersion RC have written and what they're doing with the data they're getting from the sensors. My understanding is they're basically applying special offset tables in each mode, and that is how they're able to say that it's accurate up to half a dB, because what they're doing is compensating for the variances in the sensor, depending on the frequency, and then applying that to the displayed output. We don't know if these lookup tables or these offsets are being applied globally in the sense of every meter is the same or if they're calibrating each individual meter, but it does explain why we can see a variance between some meters outputs measuring the same thing because there will always be variances in hardware and the sensor in this and the attenuator even have variances as I've shown up to say 1 dB and that will also change with temperature as well. There is nothing though from a hardware point of view that means this meter won't work with the digital systems and really the issues that I think we're seeing with the likes of DJI and HD0 will be more around how those offset tables are being applied to the data it's receiving rather than the hardware itself because this meter was basically designed for analog. There is technically no reason that the guys at Immersion RC won't be able to upgrade the firmware on this to better support digital. We know, as I've already mentioned, some people have no problems with digital at all, and some people do. So it does show that each meter can behave a little bit differently, but there does seem to be some common issues, especially as you move up race band with some of the higher frequencies showing strange results, especially on the digital OFDM style signals. Overall, it is a good product to give you an indication, but at no point should you deem the reading from this as absolute accurate or absolute correct. Measuring RF output is extremely 
difficult. The meters or the VNAs or spectrum analyzers cost many tens of thousands of dollars. And whilst this is going to be good to give you an indication, the actual RF number should never be classed as fact. Anyway, that's it for me in this one. If you found it interesting, please do consider hitting the subscribe button. Don't forget to hit the little bell next to it as well. If you'd like to support us to keep making destructive content like this, to be able to share with you guys info like this, please do consider checking out my Patreon as well as buy me a coffee. It is only by my Patreon support in the channel am I able to keep buying products like this, breaking products like this, to be able to share info like this with you guys. Anyway, that's it for me. Stay safe. I will speak to you guys again soon. So it's back together. Let's see, is it going to turn on? Hey! Not sure. Ooh, uh, that's not good, is it? But it is on. Let's see if it's actually working properly. Test it against my known readings already. On 25, we're seeing 28. On 50, we're seeing 43. That's very close. On 100, we're seeing 98, 99. On 250, we're seeing 260. That is very close. And on 500, we're seeing 429, which is virtually bang on with the readings I was getting on it before. So we're still good.